Psalm 55, verses 13 to 15. If an enemy had reviled me, that I could bear. If my foe had viewed me with contempt, that from that I could hide. But it was you, my other self, my comrade and friend, you whose company I enjoyed, at whose side I walked in the procession of the house of God. Psalm 55 is called a lament over betrayal. As a black woman, a lifelong Catholic, this seems an appropriate place to start. These few lines say so well an experience I often cannot put into words. Like many of you, I've been doing a lot of reading, taking part in webinars, and listening to podcasts recently. Much of what I plan to share this evening, apart from my personal experience, is informed by the work of Ibram X. Kendi, Shannon D. Williams, Father Brian Massingale, Archbishop Wilton Gregory, M. Sean Copeland, C. Vanessa White, Marcia Shetlane, Father Daniel Horan, and Robin D'Angelo. If you are not familiar with their work, I recommend looking into it. I grew up in Texas, on the southern border with Louisiana, near the Gulf Coast. At 18, I moved to central Texas and remained in the general area until I came to Dayton 15 years later. My first conversation about race that I can remember happened in kindergarten. My two best friends at school were Demetra and Deidre. We were like three peas in a pod. Looking back, I think we may have been the only black girls in our classroom, but I don't remember. We used to pretend that we were the Mandrell sisters. If you aren't familiar with 70s country music, think a 70s version of the Judds. And if you don't know the Judds, I can't help you. <laughs> anyway, the Mandrell sisters were three sisters who sang and had a weekly TV show. So Demetra, Deidre, and I would sing and dance in the playground, pretending. One day, one of them said, we're like the black Mandrell sisters. I was five. No one had talked to me about race up to that point. The only thing I could think of were the colors in my crayon box. I imagined a black crayon. I looked down at my arms, and I looked at my friends and explained to them that really I wasn't black. I'm more of a brownish color. To which one of them responded, girl, you are black. When I got in the car that afternoon, I said to my mom, mama, Demetra and Deidre said I'm black. My mom sighed, and she said, you are. I feel like this story, while cute maybe, encapsulates so much of my life. Walking into a crowded room as the only black person and feeling everyone's eyes on me. Girl, you are black. Pulling off the highway in an unfamiliar town and looking for another person of color so that I know I'm stopping in a safe place. Girl, you are black. Being asked to be part of a group so that the group is diverse. Girl, you are black. When I first moved to Dayton, I encountered two responses to my presence. The first one was some variation of the following. I'm sure you're happy to be out of the South and into the more enlightened Midwest as if the South has the corner on the market when it comes to racism. There are elements of that sentiment that are true. When I was in high school, the KKK marched in my hometown. I think they were protesting the integration of a Klan stronghold, a nearby sundown town named Vider. For those of you who are not aware, a sundown town is a place in which black people are not welcome after sundown. Some places had signs that said as much. 
Anyway, I remember that Saturday fairly well. I had to work that day at our city's one and only McDonald's, and I was terrified of what would happen if members of the Klan came to that McDonald's that day. I almost didn't go to work, but the need for a better paycheck won out. Another time, I was driving to school. I went to the only Catholic high school in the diocese, which is in a different city, about 25 miles away from my hometown. To get to school, I drove through Vider every day. Once, on my way to school, I saw three or four Klansmen, white hoods and Confederate flags waving. I'm not sure I ever knew why they were there, and I didn't really care. I just wanted to get to school safely. So it's true. Moving to the Midwest, I have not seen the white hoods of the Klan. But my time here has not been free of racism. Sundown towns still exist, even in the Midwest. The list of sundown towns in Ohio alone may surprise you. Google it. Sundown towns by state. Once, I was traveling with a group of people between Dayton and Indian Lake. We were traveling in several cars. In the car I was driving, three of us happened to be people of color the only people of color in the group. Someone in the lead car decided that stopping in a small town for ice cream would be a good idea. The three of us in the car that I was driving, not so much. The conversation in our car was something like this. Wait, where are we stopping? Are there even people of color in that town? Have you ever seen a black person there? I don't want ice cream that bad. We decided it would be safer to stay in the car than to get out with everyone else. We didn't know. Were we in a sundown town? Is it safe? Eventually, the group convinced us to get out of the car. The social pressure was high, and so was my anxiety and frustration at not being understood and my anxiety being dismissed as unnecessary or ridiculous. The thing is, as a black woman, I am constantly thinking of these things. Is this place safe? Do I see any other people of color? Should I keep my head down and not speak too loudly? Some may think thinking of these things is not necessary, but I think recent events and black people being murdered should tell us otherwise. When I was in college, a student political group posted flyers around campus. I don't remember the exact wording, but some were basically to the effect of, see that black girl in your class? She took your scholarship. Groups of us marched. There were protests and apologies. But something about those signs became part of me. I internalized them. Those signs watered the seeds of self-doubt that were planted by my high school guidance counselor, who informed me that there was no way I could get into the colleges to which I applied. I should aim lower. Really, it was finances that kept me from those schools, as I was accepted to them. To this day, every time I'm invited to do something, Every time someone asks my opinion on a topic or to serve on a committee or to write something or speak somewhere, my first thought is, they're only asking because I'm black and they need diversity, not because I'm actually qualified. And there is almost nothing I can do to turn off that voice in my mind. Girl, you are black. The second of the two basic responses to my presence when I first moved to Dayton was something to the effect of, how are you black and Catholic? That's actually a question someone asked me, more or less. I was giving a talk to a small group of professionals my first year here. It was a get to know a Marianist lunch gathering. And at the end of my presentation, one of the first questions asked was, so, how did you get to be both black and Catholic? 
The question took me off guard. I was shocked by the audacity, but I'm actually glad she gave me an opportunity to dispel a myth. Black Catholics do indeed exist. In the area of Texas in which I grew up, the majority of people I knew were Catholic, at least nominally. My hometown is on the border with Louisiana, which has the highest percentage of Catholics in the South and the highest percentage of black Catholics in the nation as of 2010. Many black people in Southeast Texas have roots in Louisiana, so a lot of us are Catholic or were raised Catholic. Our diocese, the Beaumont Diocese, is very diverse and rich in cultural heritage. It was in college that I first felt the tension between being black and Catholic. In high school, I had been very involved in parish and diocesan life on multiple retreat teams, youth group, diocesan youth events. It didn't make sense to me to leave that behind in college. So I got involved in the Catholic life in college and realized there were not a lot of black people involved. There were maybe two of us. I knew other black Catholics in college. My, ble my best friend was one, but there was a tension. Be with people who share your culture or be with people who share your faith. In college, I sang with a gospel choir for a short while. Great music, good people the most difficult singing I've ever done. And a few times someone would say to me, you're Catholic? I'll pray for you. I don't want you to go to hell. I had never experienced that before. And it made me cling to my faith even more and move away from these new friends and the choir. Whereas for others, I believe, perhaps they moved closer towards these friends and away from the church of their childhood. But after college, it was back to a culturally diverse parish and diocesan life. It was common to go to Mass on Sunday and see a mix of people in almost any parish I went to. Same is true when I go back to Southeast Texas, not necessarily in my hometown, but in the city in which I went to high school. Integrated parishes are pretty much the norm. Then I moved here one of the most segregated places I've lived, along with the city in which I went to college, but I was only there for four years. I'll never forget the feeling of walking into a local parish here in Dayton for the first time. I was with one of our sisters, and we walked in just before Mass began. It's a fairly large community, and the church was packed and there was not a single person of color in the church except for me. I felt the eyes of the whole church on me. It's probably not true, but that's the way it felt. Every time I looked up, someone different was staring at me. I wanted to find a way to communicate, I'm Catholic, I belong here. And yet I also wanted the floor to swallow me whole. Needless to say, I didn't return there for a while, not until people knew who I was and got used to seeing me at Catholic things. Not too long ago, I was in a meeting of leaders from a local Catholic organization. In this meeting, the president of the organization was explaining efforts on the part of the organization to welcome diverse perspectives and more people from underrepresented populations. I was so proud to be associated with such a bold and proactive vision. In the course of the meeting, a well-respected religious leader spoke up. He said, this all sounds good, but as we increase diversity, we have to be careful not to water down our mission. As if in order to welcome people from diverse backgrounds, we have to give up part of what it means to be Catholic. I would venture to say that the very opposite is true. That's what it means to be Catholic, universal, integrated, defined by love and justice, humility and compassion. 
Unfortunately, in its history, the Catholic Church and its institutions have failed to live up to what we claim to be. Again, Psalm 55 rings in my soul. If an enemy had reviled me, that I could bear. If my foe had viewed me with contempt, from that I could hide. But it was you, my other self, my comrade and friend. You, whose company I enjoyed, at whose side I walked in the procession of the house of God. Dr. Shannon D. Williams, the Albert LaPage Assistant Professor of History at Villanova and lifelong Catholic, wrote in a recent article for NCR, quote, In recent days, Catholic statements condemning the sin of racism alongside some clergy and sisters at Black Lives Matter protests across the country and world offers hope to those who have long struggled against the plague of white supremacy within and outside church boundaries. That it has taken so long for the institutional church and many non-black Catholics to embrace the rally cry of Black Lives Matter, however, cannot be ignored. It must be said, too, that the recent Catholic statements on racism and rising protests fall way short when it comes to acknowledging the church's role in contemporary crisis and direct complicity in the sins of anti-black racism, slavery, and segregation in the modern era." End quote. The Catholic Church at certain points in history was the largest corporate slaveholder in the Americas and one of the staunchest supporters of segregation in policy and or in practice. The effects of that history, the segregation and the slaveholding, is still evident in our parishes and Catholic institutions. Many seminaries and religious congregations refuse to admit black Catholics into their institutions well into the 20th century. One of our sisters once said to me early in my time of formation, I've never lived with a black person before. It's not bad. I didn't learn the slaveholding or segregationist history of the church in my 12 years of Catholic education or in Catholic graduate studies or in religious formation. I learned of this history from lectures, articles, books, and conversations with black clergy and religious who are scarred from the racism of the church and its institutions. And today, parishes and Catholic schools in predominantly black and brown communities are shutting their doors, staying in more affluent and typically whiter communities. It is no wonder it has been challenging for the American church to speak out on racism. But we cannot move forward as a church until we acknowledge the past pain inflicted and the pain which still happens. To say nothing is to be complicit. It's not enough to say everyone is welcome, or I have friends, or we have some parishioners who are all different ethnicities, or we serve a diverse population, or I work in a diverse environment and that's important to me. Don't get me wrong, these are all good things, but it's not enough. Sometimes these realities can blind us to the actual issue that we are all involved in a system of policies, procedures, practices, expectations, and behaviors influenced by conscious and unconscious biases that benefit one group over another. When we focus on the individual level, a person who consciously or unconsciously does mean, unkind, or violent things to another person because of a difference in race, this is something we can all recognize as bad and sinful. But the issues are bigger than those individuals or bad apples. Therefore, the answers have to be bigger than individuals who are not racist. 
Ibram Kendi writes, the opposite of racist is not not racist. It is anti-racist. To be anti-racist is not a new idea, but it seems to be a new buzzword these days, and yet many people do not know what it means. To be anti-racist is to participate in constant self-awareness, self-criticism, and ongoing self-examination in order to recognize and work to break down racist policies, biases, and behaviors. In short, to be anti-racist is ongoing work. It is actively identifying, describing, and dismantling what is within the individual and what is systemic in institutions. The first step is to identify, which is where many people stop. Our reading from St. Paul this evening encourages us, as God's chosen ones, holy and beloved, to put on heartfelt compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. So in humility, let us together embrace the hard work of identifying, describing, and dismantling racism in our society and in our church bearing with one another in love.